All right, welcome back to the Naval News segment. Uh, today we're going to go over a CBO report, which might be one of the most boring things that a person ever does in his lifetime, but I'm talented enough that I can make a Congressional Budget Office report interesting for you because this one deals with the United States Navy's 30-year plan. Back in June of this year, the United States Navy submitted a plan to Congress to build ships over the next 30 years. What ships are going to be built? What's the strategy going to be? And this is public information. People in China can know about this. So we're going to go over this uh, a little bit at a time here. First, the fleet size under the 2022 plan for the Navy's fleet growth will grow from 296 manned ships today to between 398 ships and 512 manned ships and unmanned vessels at some unspecific date in the future. But this is a 30 year plan implying by 2052, we will have 512 manned and unmanned ships. The 398, which is just a little over 100 ships of what we have today, are going to be the manned ships. The gap between 398 and 512 will be the unmanned surfaced and submarines uh, that will join the fleet in the next 30 years. The cost, uh, the CBO estimates that the cost of the shipbuilding to uh, the 512 manned and unmanned sh ships in uh, 2022 will be about $33 billion a year per year for 30 years. That equates to $1.65 trillion over a 50 year period or 30 year period. Yeah, it's a lot of money, enormous amount of money for just building ships. That's not maintaining them. That's not training the crews. That's not buying the uh, weapons for the magazines. That's building the ships and installing the systems on the ships. And then sea trials, too, is included in that cost. Missile capacity is a key in implication in the Navy's plan is that it was reduced. It'll reduce the number of vertical launch cells each provided with the main missile capability of the surface ships, but increase the number of manned and unmanned vessels capable of carrying them. The size reduction could be as little as a few hundred missiles or as many as a few thousand missiles, depending on the number of ships and unmanned systems in the future fleet. Uh, their capacity for carrying missile, uh, the number of ships and vessels capable of carrying missiles, however, could be increased by nearly 70%. So the way it works right now is we have arsenal ships out there like the Ticonderoga class. Even the early Burke carries a, a ton of vertical missiles. What we want to do as a United States Navy's plan is to build more ships, uh, have them be smaller ships. We're talking destroyer and frigate size, not build as many cruisers and put fewer missiles on more ships. So it's a more diverse arsenal. So if we lose that arsenal ship, we don't lose a lot of fighting capability all at once. And we're going to be putting these missiles, these VLS systems on unmanned vessels. They'll be sailing along with the fleet, just carrying sensors and weapons, doing whatever the network tells them to do. Yeah, that's coming. That's actually coming operational in 2022. That's already happening. But the big news here is we're going back to a 500 ship fleet if you include the unmanned vessels and the 398 manned vessels. This is very similar to Reagan's Navy back in the 1980s. Only back then, it was a 500 ship fleet full of manned ships. Uh, nowadays, in 2021 and going forward, it'll be a combination of manned and unmanned. All right, so here is a breakdown of what we have and where we're going with this. So today's fleet, this middle column is very important. We have 11 aircraft carriers right now. We have 14 ballistic missile submarines and uh, 54 attack boats. We really need like 100 submarines, but we have about half of what I think we need. We have 92 large surface combatants. Those would be um, Tycho's and above, including uh, the amphibious ships as well. Um, but Tycho's mostly cruisers and stuff like that. Small surface combats would include uh, the Arleigh Burks and LCSs. And then, oh, here we have the amphibious ships down here. So we have, uh, looks like 20, 30, 31 of those. And uh, so if you just add those together, you know, the aircraft carriers, submarines, and combatant ships, you come up with 233. And then we have the combat logistics ships and the support ships equal uh, 63, bringing us to what we have today, 296 ships. So what we're going to add to that is uh, obviously more manned vessels. But we want to have a total unmanned vessels of somewhere between 77 and 140 ships. So it's almost at the high end 
half of our fleet before we had more manned vessels will become unmanned. And like I said, we're bringing these unmanned systems into operation starting January of next year, presumably in the Pacific. But uh, we re- they didn't announce exactly where it's going to be. So there's a couple different plans here. Um, like they, they haven't decided which route they're going to go. They just have that goal of 512. How they get to that goal is still, uh, there's a couple di- different ways to do it. And the things that are different is they could go with more unmanned vessels if it's better and cheaper to do it that way and make a few less of the manned vessels. Because the big thing with the manned vessels is you have to maintain the crew and not just the systems and the weapons. It's a lot easier to maintain an unmanned ship than it is any crewed vessels because of the human beings. You know, the, the rotations, the ranks, uh, you know, injury, you know, people rotating because they've spent four years on board. They're ready to rotate off. Well, with an unmanned vessel, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You just have to keep it going. So but we do want to read this paragraph here. It says, although the 2022 plan lacks details about the precise number of ships and unmanned systems, like I said, we're going back and forth between the two. The Navy would purchase and how quickly the inventory would, in future would evolve. The plan embraces themes from previous shipbuilding plans, a la Reagan, uh, for structure assessments. Specifically, the plan endorses the following, a larger, more diverse fleet, more ships that are smaller, carrying less weapons than the large Tycos, for example, a reduction in the number of large, more capable ships. I should just read this. I'm sorry. I'm going to stop interjecting because he's saying the same thing that I'm saying here. A large number of smaller combatants, a subsequently larger attack submarine force. Hallelujah. Yes. Uh, The construction of more logistical ships and new types of support, larger fleet ships. And finally, the development and fielding of a large number of unmanned surface and undersea vessels. There you go. And then we break this all down. Like the biggest thing that everyone wants to know about is what's going to happen to the aircraft carriers. We're going to stay with 11 because we have the JFK. We got like three more carriers that are coming online. So it says under the 2022 plan, the future carrier force would range from nine to 11 aircraft carriers. However, it is not clear whether the range represents a reduction in the carrier force from today's force of 11, because we're already at the top end of that, uh, or a natural fluctuation caused by retirement of old ships and the commissioning of new ones under the Navy's December 2020 shipbuilding plan. The carrier force would also be ranged from nine to 11. So even though we're bringing on three more carriers over the next couple of years, uh, we'll be, I guess, decommissioning some of the older ones, which is just natural attrition. So I guess the goal right now is to maintain between nine and 11 ships. No symbolism there. It's just the way it worked out. Uh, okay, for the submarines, this is really important to us. Uh, the 2022 plan objectives force will include 12 SSBNs down from 14, although they would be eventually be Columbia class rather than today's Ohio class. So I imagine as they bring on a Columbia, they would uh, retire one oh, Ohio. It just makes sense to do it that way. We're only going to be building 12 of the Columbia, by the way. So we will have to eventually decom. 14 boats and just have eventually the 12 Columbia ballistic missile submarines out there, six on each coast. Uh, the Columbia class would not need to undergo a two-year midlife refuel of its reactor cores, thus the fewer SSBNs would be necessary. That's a really good point. The reactor they're putting in the Columbia isn't designed to be refueled at the, uh, I think it's the 30-year point. It can actually go the whole 50-year lifespan, um, supposedly. We'll see about that. That's what they say they can do. Uh, The 2022 plan would increase the number of SSNs, the attack boats, from 12 to 18 ships or 22 to 33 percent of the goal of 66 to 72. Okay, so we're going to go from 66 to 72. That makes more sense. Yeah, we really need 100. I think 100 is a nice round number for attack boats, but... Uh, He says, however, the 2022 plan indicates that the Navy would like to increase the attack submarine force sooner uh, with a rate than the rate would allow uh, to meet the demand for additional submarines. Industrial base capacity must be expanded. This is really interesting news because I had been saying that we have the industrial base right now to build those submarines for uh, Australia. And if we increase our own um, production for ourselves, turns out we don't have the industrial base to do that. So this is called, we're going to be reinvesting in, you know, General Electric's um, electric boat. There we go. Jeez. And then the one down uh, south of that around Virginia, um, I'm blanking on it right now. But we basically have two shipyards that can build nuclear submarines. We really need to get a shipyard on the West Coast that can build a nuclear submarine. But for lots of reasons, we don't have one over there on the West Coast and we really need one. 
We have shipyards on the West Coast that can build ships. They just can't build the nuclear submarines over there is what I'm getting at. Okay, if the Navy continued to build attack submarines at a rate of two per year over the next 30 years, it could achieve a force of 66 SSNs by 2048. Uh, and that's short of the goal of 72. It meets the minimum of that window, 66 to 72, if we change nothing. So I guess there's something to be said for that. In other words, this is a reasonable goal, I believe is what they're saying. This is reasonable. All right, let's talk about surface combatants real quick. Not as interesting as the carriers or the submarines, but the Navy says that the FNFS uh, indicate that the growth of the small force, com small surface combat force enables reductions in the quantity of large surface combatants while yielding a more distributive and lethal force. Uh, according to the under that plan, the number of large force combatants would decrease, but the number of small force combatants would increase. The shift in composition for the surface combatant force is one of the most important changes uh, in the 2022 plan. A key implication of that change, the capability to carry out and launch missiles is discussed earlier than in this report. We kind of already went over that. So uh, large combatants, we currently have 92 cruisers and destroyers. They're including the Arleigh Burke as a large surface combatant. Interesting. Okay, so we have 92 cruisers and destroyers. The plan would reduce that force by one third to 65 ships. I don't know if I like that. Keep the Arleigh Burke, boys. Arleigh Burke Flight 3, really good ship. I think we should keep building them. And we, I think we are, but don't stop building them. Uh, in, the, in the absence of the year-by-year -year details, the CBO analyzed four Ill illustrative scenarios regarding the Navy's future large surface combatant force. Three scenarios illustrate why the Navy w could implement the substantial reduction of the large surface combatant force outlined in the plan. One illustrate the effects of maintaining the existing build of two destroyers per year. Would that get us to 63... Let's see what it says here. In the short term, Navy plans to retire seven Ticonderogas. We've been talking about that for a while. They're getting rid of the old girls. It's their time, too. They've been around for, what, three, four decades now? It's time to move on. If the Navy continued to retire the remaining cruisers that and the older destroyers at a rate of five to seven per year, we're not building five to seven per year, so we're going to see a reduction in size, the force would fall to around the, the plan's goal uh, by 2030. So we would have a fleet of large combatants of around 65 ships in the next nine years. That's shrinking the Navy down. I don't know if that's the right answer. Retiring those ships is important. I don't think we should retire them right away. We need to, we need to build first, then retire, not the other way around. But if we retire them first, that frees up a lot of money. So that's a realistic consideration that that's exactly what the CBO does. Is there a budget office? <laughs> this is all about the dollar bills. Yeah. Like if the Navy retired the seven cruisers uh, and kept the remaining ships for their expected service life, 35 to 40 years, and built destroyers at a, the current rate of two per year, the large surface combatant force uh, of the mid-60s uh, anytime over the next 30 years. It would not reduce the size of the large combatant force to the mid 60s. Okay, so they're saying if we continue to build two per year uh, and decom them as they I expire normally, what we expect them to expire, uh, we would not shrink the Navy to the size that they want. In other words, it wouldn't free up as much money as they need. So that's the balancing act. I'm on the side of keep the Arleigh Burks and the Tycos as long as we can until we have a few of these smaller surface combatants in larger number to come out with the fleet. But there, I understand the argument of we can't do this part until we decom them. And then there's that gap of a couple of years. We're seeing this gap now between the LCS and the new Constellation class frigate. We've decommed these seven Ticonderoga cruisers and we're using this money in part to fund part of the Constellation class construction. Um, and so there's already a gap beginning between what we've already done and getting that first constellation in the water and operational, which hopefully is in two years. So it's not that much of a gap, but we'll see how the first one goes. The first ship in any new class always takes a little longer because it's new, new systems and stuff. Anyway, the composition of the future small surface combatant force remains unclear. I'm not surprised because it's got the LCS as a part of it. And nothing that involves the LCS is ever clear. Um, currently, the Navy has 23 LCS and eight mine countermeasure ships. Another 11 LCSs are under construction, really? 
The Navy retired one LCS recently and plans to retire another one this year and another four in 2022 because it's a useless ship. Why are we building 11 more? There's like a major flaw in the design of the LCS where they have to rip apart the engine room to make a, a repair to it so that it can operate normally without wrecking its um, main gears. Um, and matter of fact, we stopped receiving these LCSs that are under construction because of that problem. They're like redesign it so that we can make this change or repair easier or better yet, don't build another LCS that has this problem in the design. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe we're building 11 more of them. As we're decomming them, we're building them as we decom them. Talk about just a money treadmill. That's all that is. I'm not happy about that at all. This is ridiculous. Um, but let's try and stay focused here. We do, like I said, there's four different scenarios. There's multiple scenarios to get to this um, Navy output. So we just want to focus on this chart for a minute. It goes out to 2051, approximately 30 year plan. Uh, data sources from the CBO that we're reading. So this is referencing itself. It says under scenario one, the Navy would retire ships quickly to meet the force goals by 2030 and would maintain the size of the force with steady build rate of 1.8 destroyers a year. That's scenario one here. So they really want to get down to 65 ships. These are large combatant ships. This doesn't include submarines or anything like that. This is just the, the Tycos and the Arleigh Burks. We're trying to get those down to 65 as fast as we can, which frees up funds for future builds. Scenario two, which is this little bit longer one, uh, the Navy would maintain the steady build rate of two destroyers per year, what we're doing now, and reduce the size of force as uh, with, with retirements uh, in 2035. So this is like continuing to use the, the ships to the end of their life and then just retiring naturally. We're getting the most bang for our buck at this point. So we want to keep these ships going here. I, I think scenario two is probably the best because at least we get to use the ship longer. And under scenario three, the Navy would maintain a 35 to 40 year service life of destroyers and buy one new destroyer per year through 2036. And then after that, two new destroyers afterwards. That's scenario three here. That's kind of a hybrid of scenario uh, one and two. And then finally, scenario four, Navy would maintain 35 to 40 year service life for all destroyers and buy two destroyers per year. That's basically what we're doing right now. Scenario four. I like scenario four. Scenario four doesn't get anywhere near. I think taking these large combatants down to a, a force of 63 to 65 is a bit of a mistake. We, we might be on the brink of war. We don't want to be decomming ships before their due date. We're decomming ships early with this plan to, to, to free up money. Um, it, uh, I, it's a hard decision. I don't envy the people that have to make this decision, but the one vote from Michigan as one American citizen, I vote for scenario four. Let's keep these ships in the water as long as we can. Okay. Amphibious warfare ships says like the surface combatant force, the amphibious warfare forces experience changing compositions. Yeah. What are we going to do with the Marine ships? What's the plan here? Uh, the plan is a number of small amphibious warfare ships would increase from zero. We're going to start building a new class of ship called a small amphibious warfare ship for the Marine Corps uh, and build between 24 to 35 of them. So lots of little amphibious ships to be carrying Marines around the Pacific and, uh, you know, Persian Gulf. A number of amphibious transport ships and dock landing ships would decline from 22 to about 16 to 19 ships, a reduction of 14 to 27 percent. That's a significant uh, reduction. And I like this idea because we have very large amphibious ships uh, with a lot of Marines on them. And it's just it's a big target is what it is. So if we can break that up into you know, instead of having one large ship, have two or three smaller ships with the same number of Marines and same capability, but just on different hulls, that at least uh, reduces our risk of losing all those Marines in one attack. We don't want that would be a nightmare. Um, see combat logistic and support ships. These are very important ships that no one ever talks about because they're not the fancy warships, but they're vital to fleet operations. And so the Navy currently has 29 combat logistics ships, including 34 support ships. Those are the uh, oilers and stuff like that. Uh, under the 2022 plan, the number of combat logistics ships would increase between 56 and 75. That's interesting. Maybe because we have so many smaller ships, we would need a larger number of support vessels to, because it's not more people, but it's more individual hulls. Perhaps that's why they need more ships. I don't know. Although the 2022 plan does not provide details for what types of combat logistics ships the Navy would buy, much of the increase would probably come from the purchase of new, smaller logistics ships designed to support 
a larger, more dispersed fleet, just like what I was describing. So this is interesting. Like we're shrinking our ship designs overall, uh, starting with the new constellation frigate. We haven't bought, we haven't built a new frigate in a long time. Uh, so that's that's the beginning of this new way of thinking. Uh, the next thirty years, the rest of my life anyway, we're going to be doing um, smaller, more varied ship designs. Very cool. All right, so I'm not going to bore you to tears with this uh, this plan here. Uh, let's see if this uh, adds any new information. This is just going over the main battle force again. Okay, so here here are the range of ships. By the time this is done, it looks like. So we have a low end and a high end. So uh, this the, the ship build plan will result in 372 manned warships accompanied by 140 unmanned surfaced and submarine vessels for a total of 512. And I believe that's down from a number I heard a few months ago where they wanted over 680 combined ships. Uh, so this is a reduced number from that. But it's uh, it's still a lot of ships. It's it's increasing the number of ships we have in the water by, you know, a, a big, a large percentage right there. And that's really the end of the piece. Uh, the rest of this is just talking about VLS, how the VLS is um, they carry between 90 and 122 missiles per VLS Mark 41 VLS cell right now. They're going to reduce that to carry 32 weapons per per cell. And some ships will have two cells or three cells. Some ships, like the unmanned ones, will just have one cell of 32 weapons or even less. The unmanned vessels will have 16, like half a half cell, if you will. But we're going to have lots of unmanned little ships around the fleet just carrying around these 16 weapons and a radar and maybe even a sonar, maybe a tote array. And being a, essentially a picket ship like what the uh, Oliver, Oliver Hazard Perry used to be in the uh, during the Cold War. So a more dispersed fleet, including weapons and personnel. I think that's really smart. I'm on board with this plan. The only thing I don't agree with is a scenario one where we're decomming everybody right away. And then we start ramping up the Navy as fast as we can afford to. I don't think that's the right way. I think a more moderate approach like scenario four, where we you know, keep the ships in the water until they're just ready to be decommed and then decom them. Uh, because remember, you go to war with the fleet you have not the fleet you want or the fleet you're, you're planning for. If war were to happen next year, this plan means nothing. So we really got to keep that in mind. Anyway, I've yammered on a long time about this. That's the end of the uh, of the report. What do you guys think of the Congressional Budget Office report? Is anybody still awake out there? I know this is really dry stuff, but I try to make it interesting for you. All right. Diddley says the LCS independence class anyway is extremely good at mine hunting and the best uh, the Navy got the mine hunting is the Achilles heel of the U S Navy. I would agree with that. I, I do honestly agree with that. I give the LCS program a lot of grief, but we have to remember that it's broken up into the freedom class and the independence class of which the independence class is the better of the two. And, uh, it is a good mine hunter. Absolutely. Um, you've hit the nail on the head with that. Tarpo says what USN needs is more maintenance yards, not sexy, but you can't maintain a fleet, especially with the increased number of hulls. We're going to need more maintenance yards or increase the size of the maintenance yards we have. And we really need to consider building or converting a shipyard, improving a shipyard on the West Coast to build nuclear powered ships. The Californians are going to have to get over it. The people in Oregon are going to have to come into the 21st century, man. The people in Seattle, they're going to need to calm down a little bit, stop rioting every night and help us build some nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines, rather. Uh, Pice says, hey, just subbed to you a week or two ago, my first time catching you live. You have charisma and should be in movies. Well, I don't know about that. Have you seen this body? <laughs> I don't think I'll be in movies, man. Uh, the, 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 there's a thing for actors. After you train your acting skills and your voice, you need to train your abs so that the director can use your abs. Uh, I don't have an abs. I, I have more like a, a keg right, right here. So that's not gonna happen. But thank you for the compliment. It's very nice of you to say that. Um, Kemp says, think you're looking at it too much in a number wise. Well, this is a numbers report. So I am looking at it very much from a numbers point of view. But what did you go on to say there? Let's see if I can find your comment again. Uh, da, 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 I'm sorry, it scrolled up. Oh, I missed your point. I apologize. Next time I'll read the whole thing before I remark. It sounds like AI is allowing a resurgence uh, in the School of Naval Thoughts, small ships killing bigger ones. Well, I'll tell you what, it doesn't take much to sink a ship. We learned that in World War II. We had small little airplanes sinking really big ships. 
is the lesson of World War One and Two. Yeah, Pressup says ever since World War Two, damage control has always been a key strength of the U.S. Navy. I would agree with that, except for in that uh, LHD six that burned down next to the pier. But that was arson. That's a little bit different. Well, I suppose warfare is arson. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I have to think about that. He says uh, the concern that unmanned ships might have issues. That's true. Let's say an unmanned ship breaks down and has to go under tow. Most of those unmanned ships are so small, I don't think it would slow down a large ship towing it. But then again, do you want one of your large ships towing a small ship? You know, no, you don't. You don't want that. I have a keg for ballast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jovi says, how do you think the plans match up to the Chinese aspirations for a thousand ships? I did not know that they wanted a thousand ships. I'll tell you what, the Chinese right now have the ability to outbuild uh, a large number of ships than we do. Like our ships tend to be more complex, take longer to build. We only build two destroyers a year with two submarines a year, even though they keep talking about, about building three submarines a year. That actually that hasn't actually happened yet, even though it was supposed to. It says, dude, I'm dying laughing so hard. I want that t-shirt to say, people in Seattle need to stop rioting and help build us nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah, right? Put that on a mug. <laughs> uh, let's see, CK18 says, uh, I see, I'm seeing the new frigates being the most modern day Fletcher class. Yeah, I, I, I'm putting a lot of hope personally into this new Constellation design. Uh, the initial designs that I've looked at and read, stuff they made public, it looks really promising. So let's hope that they don't change that because kind of what happened to the LCS, in the beginning the LCS looked promising too, but as they began building it, they began taking little bits off of it, systems and then even some weapons, and it turned into a mine hunter, like uh, chat said. And realistically, any ship can be a mine hunter once. CK18 says, I oh, already read that one. Havoc says, I'm not, I cannot fathom the idea of so many unmanned vessels. Unmanned assets only work against lower tier adversaries. Yeah, basically, they're just mobile uh, VLS platforms, and then they'll have some sensors on them. That's really the extent of it. It's really not as complicated as you may think. The most complicated thing about integrating unmanned ships to the fleet is the data link network. That's, that's vital to making that work. And China is very good at disrupting that. Cronus uh, says, is there a use for USN conventional subs? I, I don't see a use. I've, I've been trying to justify that for a long time, but because the Atlantic and the Pacific are both so big and they're essentially our walls of Babylon for our continent, we need to be able to get across those and bring the fight to the enemy quickly which is what the nuclear submarine brings us. So no, I really think for the United States and Canada, we, we, we need nuclear submarines so we can get to the battlefields that are far away from us. We don't wanna fight World War III on the continent of the United States because we saw what happened to Europe with two world wars 20 years apart. It decimated those countries. It took a long time to recover that. Could you imagine what modern warfare would look like? I would rather fight a modern warfare in China and Taiwan than in California. Havoc says, my fear is a, a near near tier adversary rapidly shoots down satellites, wrecks unmanned capability in a hurry. Well, the unmanned capability would be line of sight in a fleet. Yeah. But I mean, satellites are a part of it as well, but it, that's not the only part of it. Yeah. Skynet is active. Watch out for Harney. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's move on to the next story here. I got a couple good ones for you. 